347. 347. I failed to mention this morning, so I tried to make myself be reminded to say this evening that I appreciate Eli and the invitation that he extended last Wednesday evening. Uh, if you had, someone else would have told me that it was his first time, I would not have hardly believed it because he certainly uh, acted very calm and very uh, cool under that kind of a pressure, but appreciate that very much, and I appreciate Thatcher for uh, the scripture reading that he did both this morning as well as this evening. Certainly appreciate all of the young men, Rod and others that we have that do a very good job in the things that they are doing, and we pray that that will continue to be so and that they will continue to progress in the things that are spiritual, the things that truly help us to be what we ought to be in this life, to be the example before others, as well as to be pleasing unto God. Appreciate the presence of everyone. Sorry that Sister Kathy is not feeling well enough to be with us. Certainly good to see Brother Gary uh, able to be with us this evening. So we're thankful for the presence of each and every one. Uh, one other thing before I forget, I do have the uh, large announcements as well as the individual handout announcements replenished on the table. So again, as I said this morning, uh, don't hesitate to take the last one. And if you do so, while we'll have enough, uh, we'll re replenish the supply this coming Wednesday evening and we'll continue that all through uh, the gospel meeting right up until uh, the very last night. So we urge you to continue your efforts in trying to tell others about the gospel meeting. Last Sunday morning, we did a lesson on the question of must I be a member of the local church? And then last Sunday evening, we did a lesson on labels, wherein we particularly talked about the labels of conservative and the labels of liberal. Tonight, I want us in our study to ask the question, why does where we assemble matter? You know, we live in a religiously pluralistic society. We have plenty of people in this country who believe in almost every religion that man has been able to come up with. And then there are many people who don't believe in really in much of anything. And likewise, there are a multitude of different varieties, I sometimes call them flavors, many flavors of Christianity that are within our society. And there's now a strong relativizing, I guess is the word, maybe I've invented the word, but I think we all know what relative means. It means something that's not absolute. And so we now have a strong trend in religious matters. This tolerating of plurality has really indirectly led to the embracing of plurality. And as time goes on, denominations have become not only tolerant of one another, but they are now embracing one another. And so it seems that as America learns more even about the Eastern religions, that their concepts and their ideas are becoming more tolerated and more accepted. So all of this has led to an attitude that it doesn't really matter where you go or what you are religiously. In fact, it doesn't matter if you go anywhere or if you really profess to be anything. And this is the way it is. But is it the way 
that it should be. I want us to consider some questions. Does it really matter if we assemble with others for religious purposes? Do the differences between churches really make a difference? And why can't we just go to the church of our choice? And really, you know, isn't what I need from the church service the most important thing? So I want us to examine these matters, and I want us to see if it does matter whether that we assemble. You know, an idea that's growing, and it's not a new idea, but it continues to grow, and it continues to increase steadily in its popularity. And that is that a person can be just as good of a Christian and not be a part of any church. And there is a great misunderstanding in the minds of many people concerning the concept that they have of church. So rather than seeking to find the Christianity that we read about in the New Testament and do away with all of these institutional doctrines of denominationalism, then many choose to just not be a part of any church, not to assemble or associate with anything that has to do with church. That's, that's their concept. That's where, or what they have arrived at in their thinking. So it would be good for us to ask, is assembly necessary? And we talked about this a little bit in our study last Sunday morning. But again, is assembly necessary? And if so, why is it necessary? And also, we need to be sure that we understand the why in the answering of our question. To begin with, we assemble because God commands it. We're familiar, are we not, with Hebrews 10, verse 25? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a man who some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. But maybe it would do us good to look at the verse before verse 25 and to look at the verse after verse 25. The reason we assemble is to be found in the verses before and in the verse after, verse 25. So let's look at it. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the man who some is, but so much the more as you see today approaching. For if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. See the two things that are mentioned in the verse before and verse after Hebrews 10, 25. The reason why that we assemble is to encourage and to be encouraged. For us to encourage others and for others to encourage others us. So let us consider one another, as the passage says, in order to stir up love and good works. So we do assemble in order to encourage and be encouraged. But then also we see that verse 26 says that to do the very thing that verse 25 is forbidding is to sin willfully. If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, verse 25 is a part of the truth, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, then there's nothing else. There's nothing that remains. To just simply not acknowledge truth 
is a willful sinner. But then too, we also see in 1 Corinthians 14 this very reason of why that we assemble. In verse 12, even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. And in verse 26, how is it then, brethren? Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. We don't have time, but take the time and read 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. There's not a single thing that is addressed in particular in chapter 14, but what does not come down to the conclusion that whatever is done in the assembly is to be done for one sole purpose, edification. If something is done that is not edifying, then it has no part in the work of the church. Whether it was spiritual gifts or whether it's the things that we're commanded to do now in our present day, all of those things that God has given are things that we need and must have to use for edification. And what I mean by edification is strengthen, to build up, to make strong. And so the purpose of our assembling and the purpose of anything that's done in the assembly, as 1 Corinthians 14 teaches, is for edification. So we see that one of the purposes of assembly is to encourage our fellow saints. See, God didn't have to establish local assemblies for Christians in order for us to have association, but he, you know, he could just left us out on our own, but he's not. And for our good, and because of his wisdom, he has established, he has authorized the establishment of local assemblies of his people. So we need to see that the assembly is there for our benefit. And we deprive ourselves of spiritual gain. Another way of saying that, I guess, is we deprive ourselves of spiritual growth when we do not assemble. That's why the command, do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together. You know, when we come together to get right down to it, if we fail and do exactly what Hebrews 10 and verse 25 says, and that is we do forsake the assembling of ourselves together, you know who the biggest loser is? If I forsake the assembly, I, I'm the biggest loser. If you forsake the assembly, you are the biggest loser. And therefore, we need to strive to assemble so that we can receive the benefits and that we can bestow the benefits. And remember, we said that was to encourage and to be encouraged, as God has so intended. You know, there are many people who agree that we should assemble as Christians. They have no problem with accepting that fact. But then they turn right around and they believe that all churches are essentially the same and that they are Christians in all churches. And you know, it's easy to understand this belief that many people have. Because when you look at the current situation with denominations, you could see why that would be an easy conclusion to come to. You know, most denominations, while they have belief, yet they have worked hard 
to agree to disagree. And what I mean by that is that they not only tolerate one another, but they always they also accept one another. You know, there's been such a reduced emphasis on doctrine that most of the time there is essentially no distinction between most Protestant denominations. And when you look at the evangelical movement that began 20 or 30 years ago, and we have seen in the last decade or so the social gospel that has made its way, then that has to only blur the lines between religious organizations. And so we asked the question, are all churches the same? See, it, what we're saying is it's, it's not who teaches what anymore. That used to be the case, even in the denominational world. Who teaches what? That, that's not it no more. What we have now is who offers what? And that's where most churches are. And while it is that that we can see many churches are similar, yes, it's not true that all churches are the same. There's a difference in the word similar and the word same. In Ephesians 4 and verse 4, there is one faith and there is one body. How many churches do you think today would teach Ephesians 4 and verse 4? Well, if they did, they would be contradicting the fellow denominations that they have agreed to disagree with. Because they allow for many faiths, they allow for many bodies. And we know what the scripture says concerning what the body is. Colossians 1 and verse 18 says that the body of Christ is the church. And then two, Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15 that the church is to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. A pillar is a support. The ground is a foundation. So the church is both the ground and the support of the truth. So truth is that which is to be utmost when it comes to what the church stands for, what the church believes, what the church teaches, what the church practices. And you know, in the second chapter of Revelation, we have letters that are addressed to the seven churches of Asia in chapters 2 and 3. But if we look just in Revelation chapter 2, what do we notice? We notice here, to sum it all up, that the church is not to tolerate false teaching. It's not to tolerate immorality. The church at Ephesus was the first one that was mentioned in Revelation 2. And what's mentioned there is the fact that there were some who were obviously portraying themselves as apostles. And Paul said to the church at Ephesus that you have found them not to be apostles. When you look at the next letter, it's written to the church at Pergamos. And to the church at Pergamos, he talks about the doctrine of Baal and how they needed to beware of that. And then when we look at the third letter in Revelation 2, we see the letter to Thyatira. And the letter there is speaking of a prophetess by the name of Jezebel who has seduced many into the practice of immorality. And in all three of those instances where that either false doctrine or the influence for the practice of immorality is being referred to, the command is always repent. Repent or else I'll remove your candlestick. So the church is not to tolerate false teaching. It's not to tolerate immorality. And so what we can see from these scriptures, we can see regarding the church 
that Jesus recognizes. It is to be one, one body, as we see. It is to be only accepted, to accept and to stand for the truth, if it's the pillar in the ground of the truth, and it's going to reject all error. And when we look at the denominational world, we see that most churches don't meet this criteria. Like I said, they stand for many faiths. They allow for many faiths. Plurality, tolerance, acceptance. So there's no such thing as one faith. There's no such thing as one body. And when it comes to being the pillar and ground of the truth, I was a preacher on the radio this morning, and he said, go out to the house of God. Go to the house of God today. Well, really, he's advocating what we're talking about here. Just go to the church of your choice. And he said, go to the house of God and hear the word of God. And I thought to myself, I, I'm going to have to kind of challenge him on that statement. Honest, truly, and humbly. I really don't think that a lot of what's done in denominational churches today is much of God's Word. God's Word has sort of been put in the background somewhere. There's too many other things that, for the most part, denominationalism is trying to use that really the Word of God is not the appeal anymore. Truth is no longer the emphasis. Or else there would not be this acceptance, there would not be this endorsing of one another that we've seen over the last many years. How many denominations are content to agree to disagree? And see, when this happens, no one is in error, is it? And when this happens, there is no right and there is no wrong. It's basically the idea you're okay and I'm okay. Where we are religiously. How can denom denominations compromise God's truth? And, you know, we're now seeing many denominations in acceptance of homosexuality, in acceptance of adultery, in acceptance of many forms of immorality. <laughs> and some even try to attempt to rationalize their position by using the Bible to justify adultery and homosexuality. Now, there's certainly differences among churches. And the difference lies in whether they are recognized by Christ or not. You see, Christ will not recognize those who do not do the will of the Father. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, churches that seek to do the will of God are going to uphold his truth. And they're not going to accept error. And I want, us, I want to urge us to strive to be such a church that will uphold the truth and not accept error. What about this one? We've mentioned it already. You hear it all the time. As I said, I heard it 
basically on the radio this morning, right after the program went off the air. Or this idea that, you know, go to the church somewhere today. You know, if you spent much time at all on driving the interstates, I'm sure you've seen semi-trucks with a sort of a bumper sticker on the back of the trailers, and they say, go to the church of your choice. I've seen most of them on the Covenant transport uh, vehicles. I'm sure Philip has seen that. And, and you know, I understand what they're getting at in, in, a, in a sense. You know, these signs are so written as not to offend anyone. And two, the sentiment that's expressed is the desire for people to have some religion in their life. So I acknowledge that in what they're trying to say. And, you know, such signs request the attitude, really, it's an expression of the attitude of nearly everyone today. Modern America has seen the ever-increasing attitude of a sort of a cafeteria-style Christianity. You know, you can go, you can shop around for churches. You're looking for a church that, you know, you would sort of like looking for a car. You know, when you go looking for a car, you go go to trade or go to buy a car, what do you look like? You, you, you go and you try to find one that feels like it, it, it just me. So a lot of times people approach churches and they're seeking and finding churches with that same attitude. And more often than not, the things that people have in mind when they go church hunting is how good is the youth program? Or, you know, is the, is the worship, what kind of worship do you have, contemporary or traditional? Of course, many people now are looking for the more contemporary rather than the traditional, even in the denominational church. And it's the idea of, well, how big is the church? Because some people, that's, that's what they look for in the church. They look for large numbers. That's what they're looking for. And all of this, when you look at it, it's less about what does this church stand for? What does this church believe and practice in regards to what God's word says? So should we be going to the church of our choice? If it comes right down to being our choice in the matter, you know, as we've already said, God has standards for churches that he recognizes. You know, the religious world should be less about what man wants and more about what God wants. In John chapter 4, verse 20, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you, say, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when we will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those that worship him must worship in spirit. And in truth, you see, God seeks. <laughs> it's not a matter. It's not a matter of man seeking. It's a matter that God seeks men and women to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And you know, in the end, the true criteria ought to be whether we are going to 
the church of God's choice. See, it's not a matter of our. It's a matter of God's choosing. You know, in a very widespread attitude in the religious world today is, what do I get out of? That's what people are looking for. What do I get out of? What's in it for me? And you know, more often than not, the question most often asked is, what can the church do for me? You know, many times Christians will seek to leave one congregation and go to another because the answer they sometimes give is, oh, well, I'm, not just, I'm just not getting anything out of our congregation. You know, is this the type of attitude that God seeks from his people? And while it is our desire to be saved that leads us to God and to the church, Yet, perhaps at the start, that's all well and good, but we need to give more consideration not to our need with the passing of time. Certainly we had a need that brought us to the point of salvation and brought us to the church. And as we talked about last Lord's Day morning, the local church of which we placed membership. But is that where we need to remain? That we're just seeking that which is for us. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 24. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Romans 15 and verse 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. And in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. Let each of you look not only for your, out for his own best interest, but also for the interest of others. You see, a most important concept of Christianity is the need to no longer seek our own selves, to seek our own desires, but to work and strive for the betterment of other people. And that takes maturity. It takes maturity to turn the attention away from ourselves and turn it in the direction of others. So it takes maturity to have that attitude, much less to actually do it. So we have to grow into it. It's sort of like one of those things that we add to our faith, as Peter talks about. And yet many, however, never reach that point of maturity. And really, they never reach it because they never seek it. You know, for years and years, even their entire lives, some will always just seek what they want, what they want. They always have complaints about the way things are going, but they don't do much of anything to help make it better. They don't help to be a solution. They just continue to be a problem with their complaints. And many times, these individuals will leave a congregation, acting as if the problem was within the congregation when the reality of the matter was the problem was with them. It was not with the church where they were coming from. It was them. So the question ought to be, what can the church do for me as much as what can I do for the church? See, this, this is the transition that needs to take place at some point in our lives. We can understand the babe in Christ 
side and you know what can the church do for me? But if we grow and if we mature as we need to and as we ought to, then that ought to someday change. We are servants. As God's people, we are servants. And as servants, we don't need to be complainers. But as servants, we need to find happiness in our assembling together. And those that seek to do what we're just talking about, and that is to build others up. As they're building others up, they will receive encouragement themselves. And why? Because they have the right attitude. They have the proper mindset. It's not what the church can do for me, it's what I can do for the church. And certainly while there are many legitimate reasons that causes people to leave congregations, it's sad that far too often those that need the most encouragement, the most need to mature, are the ones that leave. So let us strive to grow in faith, and be a good servant to the Lord and to one another. So why were uh, assembly matters? I think we've seen that many of the ideas that are popular in our society and in the religious world today are not what they ought to be. It certainly does matter where you assemble. If you assemble with a group of people who love the Lord and they love one another and they're doing things that are pleasing in God's sight, you can build up as you can be built up as you are building others up. You can be encouraged as you are encouraging others. And you can be a part of God's kingdom. And in the end, you can receive the reward. If you assemble with other groups that don't hold to God's truth, their focuses are not God's focuses, then you're certainly going to run the risk of losing your own soul and becoming discouraged with religion in general. And I think we see and I think we know of people that have come to that point in their life. They're unfaithful. Why? Because they've gotten discouraged. And do we not see what could very well be the reasons why they become discouraged? See, God should be the one who directs us in our lives. And we, being humble, and being obedient, we ought to strive to please him in all that we do. And that includes where we choose to worship, to assemble. And yet if our only focus is ourselves, what we want, where we want to go, believe what we want to believe, then we're not going to be able to please God. We're just only going to be pleasing ourselves. So when we assemble, when we assemble, let's choose the church of God's choice. And we can grow in the faith. We can seek the good of others. Knowing that we are pleasing to God, and in the end of it all, we can have eternal life. So yes, it does matter where we assemble. Why are you a Christian? Well, I'm just saying, well, I wanted to have forgiveness of my sins. Well, that's a good reason. Because 
you can turn to your soul and you know that sin is that which will keep your soul out of heaven. So yes, that's a good answer to that question of why are you a Christian? Now the question is, why are you a part of the local church? Is it because you're here for what the church can give to you? Well, if you're a babe in Christ, that's, that's certainly not, not wrong because a baby needs a lot of things. A baby in the physical world needs a lot of attention, a lot of things. But if we've been Christians long enough that we need to have grown spiritually out of that stage of infancy into a middle age or a full grown, mature Christian. Is your mindset still thinking of what can the church do for me? Is that still why you are a member of the church here at East Albuquerque? You know, we're all at different levels of our spiritual maturity. Sometimes age has a lot to do with that physical age. Sometimes the number of years that we've been a Christian, that certainly comes into play. So there are a lot of factors that figure in. But what I wanted to try to do in our study tonight is to see that the reason why we assemble, the reason why we're here as a Christian is to be encouraged, yes, but also to encourage others. We need encouragement. But so do others. And is the life that we're living, are the things that we're saying, are the attitudes that we're manifesting when we are together with one another, are all of those things serving to be an encouragement to others or not? That's what we need to think seriously. That's, that's the application that I need to make to this lesson. And I hope it's the application that you will make to this lesson. Are you still dependent upon the church and what it can do for you? When will the point ever be reached that it will not be so much of that much of a concern anymore, but what you can do to be an encouragement to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? I know there are here those that have not obeyed the gospel, but even though you've not, you need to be aware, you need to count the cost of what it means to be a Christian. And growth needs to be a fundamental part of what being a Christian is. It's not just a matter of hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. Those are the things that we call first principles. Paul refers to them in Hebrews. But after we've done the first principles, then there is growth that needs to occur. There's to add into faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly of kindness, and love. And in all of those virtues that we refer to them as, there is, again, we can see the subtle turning from what can the church do for me and a turning into what can I do? What can I contribute? What do I contribute? And it's not all in the form of money. That's not what I'm talking about when I talk about contribute. It's what do we do to contribute to the overall edification that is the whole purpose, point of our assembly. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, Keep that in mind. We want you to become a Christian. We want you to have your sins forgiven. But we want you to also grow and to become mature, to be that encourager as you are being encouraged. And we urge you to obey, obey the gospel even at this moment. For those of us that are Christians, can we maybe see ourselves that, you know, here I am, I've obeyed the gospel X number of years ago, 
and yet I still have this basic attitude toward the church that I come, I fill my place in the pew, I give them my means on the first day of the week, and I fulfill my responsibility, I fulfill my duty. Is that all being a member of the local church means? Well, I'm afraid then you're the one with that attitude that what can the church do for me? Maybe there's some repentance. Maybe there's some changes that need to occur that will get us started where we need to get started in the direction that we talked about in our study tonight. So if you're subject, and we can assist you to any end of obeying the gospel or repenting of your sins as one that is an erring Christian, please let it be known by coming to the front while we stand to sin.